Okay, so welcome back everybody. And uh, today we continue discussing uh, prototypes and in particular the most uh, common, uh, probably the most useful form of prototypes, uh, which are paper prototypes. Hmm? Um, the idea is quite simple, trying to, to sketch the user interface on a, on a paper sheet or one or more sheets of paper where you try to draw the main points, the main, uh, the main elements of the interface, the main, uh, um, let's say, organization of the spaces and the widgets that can be included in there. And then can be used to test and to feel Okay, the usage of the, of the user interface, uh, even you know, months uh, before it can be implemented. Um, so basically, we have uh, a, an approximation of what the screen would look like. Uh, we may uh, use pieces of paper to show screens, screen content. We may use them to show the device frames, uh, for example. Uh, if you have any pop-up in your interface, you could have a separate sheet of paper that you just uh, put uh, uh, there uh, when it should appear, and so on. So it's easy to create a sort of dynamic behavior that you expect from, uh, from real uh, applications. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of the user, it's quite natural interacting with that because you, know, you just have to, to point with your finger to the user interface element where you would actually, say, tap with your finger if it's a touch interface or click with your mouse if it's a traditional interface. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, uh, uh, you can swipe, you can scroll, whatever. So every kind of uh, uh, interface operations can be done easily and intuitively with your hands. So basically what happens is that the user doesn't feel uh, an obstacle or doesn't need to translate in their mind uh, the kind of interaction they need to do. Hmm? Um, but they can act directly on the pseudo interface uh, uh, represented uh, on paper. Hmm? And of course this illusion hmm, is made more concrete uh, by usually a comp an operator, computer operator, that who will uh, actually move the pieces of paper and make the right uh, content appear at the right time. Okay, so like we said before, uh, last week, uh, we have a, a low, low fidelity in the look and feel and the graphical aspect, uh, but a quite high fidelity in the depth of the behavior and the understandability of the interface. So if you don't understand what a widget is, what a button is, what an icon is, uh, you can already um, sort it, uh, you can already detect the problem at this stage. Uh, even more, because maybe the icon is not perfectly drawn. So if there is a little bit of ambiguity, it will come out easily, more easily not, uh, right now rather than with the polished icons. Hmm? The ingredients, <laughs> the material for creating paper prototype are extremely basic. So everything that probably you have in your drawer, um, paper, pen, pencil, scissors, uh, post-its, uh, and so on. Okay, you may want to have some photocopy if you uh, are creating an interface with many variants, so you don't have to draw everything from scratch, you draw the, the general template of the application without any specific uh, uh, content or widget in, inside, you make some copies and then you just fill it, just for, for being faster. Um, and you can speed up uh, your work maybe with some reusable components. So if you find that you are using over and over again, for example, a calendar component, okay, why not print it once uh, and make it some copies so that you can stitch it in the right place uh, in the different screenshots where, where you need it, hmm? for example. Hmm? And uh, so <clears throat> it's a very basic um, uh, skill and, and technology, let's say, uh, if here we are going fancy because we, have, we also have a colored markers, okay? But in many cases, a paper prototype would be 
black and white, okay? Um, that uh, would, would, in many cases, reach the goal uh, at the same time. So colors are not used for rendering the actual color of the interface that, in most cases, has not been decided yet, but maybe just to highlight some elements or to show, okay, this has been selected, or, uh, or to just to draw the attention of the user to some aspects. Hmm? <coughs> so, of course, the main advantage is that doing a sketch is, is maybe a hundred times faster than creating even a, a very draft uh, uh, in, interface in, uh, in HTML, for example. Hmm? So it's really fast. And it's easy to change. And the interesting part is that you can also change a paper prototype while you are testing it. So if there's something that you feel is not right, you feel the users are constantly struggling or they, they don't understand or, or they confuse different items, you just have to have you know, um, an eraser and a, pen, and a pencil with you. You just can erase the element and modify it on the fly and check with the user, okay, would this, in this way, would it be, would, would it be more understandable? Would it be more uh, usable hmm, for you? So it's something that you don't need to have you know, a final version, then test it out, uh, having you know, uh, very strict uh, testing protocols. It's something that you try out with, you, with your users and it may happen that you're just reworking some portion of it uh, with your users. Of course, this would, you need to be careful because uh, you don't want to test uh, 17 different versions of the same screens with 17 different people, okay? Because at the, at the end, you won't have any maybe real information. Uh, but in some cases, you maybe have some test users after two or three users that are constantly find, finding a problem why do you still, or you, you will expect that the, 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 the remaining users hmm. will also have that problem. So you are was, wasting the opportunity of testing or, or discovering other problems because there is this one that you already discovered and is in some way blocking or attracting the attention of the user. So you correct that and the, for the second half uh, of the test uh, you work with a revised version. Hmm. So, uh, this is not something that you could do on the fly if you had an interface draw with uh, Photoshop or in uh, HTML. And you are, uh, you won't have any, any problem and to, to throw everything away after the testing with users. Okay, you spend so little time that the, the, the actual physical piece of paper doesn't need to be conserved or doesn't need to um, uh, it's not a legacy that you have to, to keep uh, and you, are, you, you didn't invest so much time. So it's okay for set, to set it aside and start over maybe with another part or with another design. Mm -hmm. Of course, what you will get and will you retain is the knowledge about uh, whether design is working or not. Okay. Um, we don't waste time on drawing details in the paper prototype, okay? If there is a title, we don't need to, right now to decide all the details of the words in the title. You know that choosing the right words, especially for titles, for menus, for sections, is very important, it's very difficult also. But if you are, let's say, just testing the functionality of, a, of an interface, maybe you don't need to decide the actual names of the sections or the menus and so on. So you can just write dummy word or even just a, a wiggly line saying, okay, this is the space for, for a word. And if it's uh, with a bold marker, it will be a, a title. If it's with a um, thin pen, it will be just uh, text content. So you are telling your users, we haven't decided this yet. And you are also telling, don't focus your attention on that, on that part of the design. So I'm detailing more, say, the part of the functionality that I want to test with you. Mm -hmm. and, and in this way, also, the users could also, are forced not to 
you know, give comments about the details, about the color of a button or some other uh, nitpicking detail. And if they give feedback, that it should be on the real content because it's the only thing that it shows. Hmm? Um, and basically, all in this activity, well, it's not uh, an issue for us, but you could also, you could also involve uh, you know, designers or graphical designers or, or even end users. You don't need any programming skill for doing this. Uh, you just need a good understanding of what is the interface you are designing, hmm? you're planning to do. And uh, you can find, uh, you know, if you go to Google and search for paper prototype, you'll find a lot of examples. Uh, for example, here in the, in the first picture, we have a, a guy who tried to design a, a tablet interface, and he was testing it uh, both on landscape and portrait mode on two different uh, screen sizes. So the same element uh, has have been positioned in different ways to fit, of course, uh, the available space and the available uh, layout. So they have a vertical layout. You see there's only a single column and a double column layout uh, for, the, for the landscape uh, larger version. Hmm? And uh, we, this simply, this black frame tablet, we know it's a tablet. We know it's an iPad or an Android tablet. And we, with our experience, we are bringing a lot of the knowledge about how this device works, whether it can be rotated, whether it's heavy, uh, how to uh, handle it with one hand, with two hands. We know, already know all of that. So we just need this black frame of cardboard that will automatically convey all the knowledge we have about how a tablet works. And if we see something inside, we know that we, can, we are supposed to be able to touch it and probably also supposed to be able to scroll through it and so on. So all this is just coming from the context automatically, from the user. It's already in the user's mind. You are just triggering the, their content saying, okay, this is a tablet. Looks like a tablet. Like, okay, when you're watching a movie, no? you are so inside the movie story that you take for granted that some things uh, are true, even if maybe the story is a, is a fantasy one or a science fiction one, you quickly adapt to the rules of the context in which you are. So this, our brain is very good at doing this. This person is a more precise person, so they both, or they created a stencil. Okay, you see that this is a plastic stencil where you have all the main shapes that you could use to create the user interface. So you just shape for the button, for the icon, and uh, um, for the scroll bar, and so on. So this is just a tool that will help you to draw the different parts of the interface in a consistent way, probably. Maybe also in a nicer way, in a more precise way. Hmm? So it can be, you can, you can shop for this kind of stuff. Hmm? So you can uh, have it, and uh, on the bottom you see a pre-printed piece of paper where you already have the background of the, of the phone with the, with the frame and with the, uh, say, the, the, the empty content and the fixed navigation element. So you have the notification area, the title, and so on. They are already pre-printed on this sort of a notebook. So you can buy one of these or you can just print some, some pages where you have a, um, the, the, the common frame. So in that way, it will be much easier or much faster to draw different screenshots. You just have to add the details inside. Uh, in this right picture, we have uh, one person which is trying to uh, test uh, horizontal swiping. So when the user is swiping right or left, uh, they will simply pull this piece of paper or to the right or to the left, and the right portion of the, of the interface will show beneath uh, the, uh, the, the frame, basically. So, of course, the user should be instructed, okay, please look only here, don't, don't care about what's uh, on the sides. Uh, but uh, after the, the first interaction, okay, the user knows where to look. Uh, and so it's easy to maybe design screens that move and so on. Uh, um, and this is not just uh, you know, a theoretical work. Um, I found on, the, on Twitter, probably, yes, uh, this 
a real uh, fragment of a paper prototype. In, this was, uh, for example, the design, the initial steps of the design of the Windows terminal. Okay, in Windows 10, where there's a terminal application that is very rich in features, and they try to pack all the features basically in the, in the toolbar at the beginning, in the tab, far, tab bar, okay? Because if you have a terminal, you don't have any menus, you don't have any icons, and so on. It must be very essential, but it must be feature rich, so you have the, the action for splitting the terminal, for creating a new tab, and so on. And so they had the first uh, ideas about how the, the, um, the tab bar should work. What are the functionality? Okay, do we put, what kind of icon do we put? What kind of title do we have? How to show that a tab is selected? Uh, how to close or how to create? So there's an X for each tab and there's a plus for creating new ones. And this plus could have a context menu. Should it be this way or that way? So there, are, they were reasoning about uh, how to create this, inter this interface, and they were exploring different alternatives on a notebook, on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and should this plus, for example, be just beside the last tab, or should the plus should be on the right, for example, separate from, from the tab? We can try. We can test. In a in an early stage, we can. This is just a tool for reasoning among the, uh, the, the members of the design group. We are sitting at a table, we are sketching something, and we ask ourselves questions. Then we come to a decision, and later on we can test th this decision with the, our users. But it's very quick and easy to explore them, okay? You see the difference between this and this is very visually uh, Noticeable, so you can, you can feel that there are different alternatives and you can already make your mind whether you prefer the first or the second one. Okay, the, 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 the problem here is um, understanding that this will open a pop-up menu related to this plus button. So is it clear in this way or in that way? Probably in the right one. But uh, you could also have the other option of a one single button with a plus and the menu sign beside that. But then it will become more difficult to understand whether that, that, that different actions will happen whether you click on the plus or on the, on the arrow. So there are a lot of small details. You, we don't notice them when we are using the final application. But you know, every pixel has been designed by someone. And we hope they, the reason that they stopped for a moment and reason uh, about uh, which pixels to, to insert, which we should uh, to use, and where to put it. Hmm? And these are the, the questions that at the time they were still uh, open questions. Okay. In our discussions, we found we decided something, and something is left for, for the future. Hmm? Do we need a favorites box? Question mark. Okay, let's decide it later. So it's a very simple tool. Um, if you want to show some dynamics, uh, okay, this person was a bit uh, into paper prototypes and decides uh, to, to create a lot of them to show the different screens. So when the user clicks, you are ready to just substitute the screen with another one, and so the user feels that it's going through um, a, whole, a whole new application. Or, uh, Let's mute it. Uh, this, in this case, they built a, a, a very fancy paper prototype for showing an email application. So we already, we all know how to use an email and you see that people are uh, expanding the headers. They are attaching a file, selecting the files to attach. And uh, okay, show that this file has been attached right now. So it's using this, uh, no, um, Techniques of both having uh, extra windows that are put there and uh, having uh, you know, expansible windows like using just the, this accordion mechanism, basically. And you see that the graphics are quite poor, but we can understand the workflow. 
we can understand where you need to click and what happens uh, in every case. Okay, so it's open for maybe a search window and, uh, and so on, and the actions. There's a lot, uh, some, of course, preparation work because you need to prepare all the possible alternatives that you want to explore in this case. But then the behavior of the user, you see that they are totally different roles. The user and the site is just using the interface and the simulator, which is an, an operator that just, just uh, will, will make it happen, will uh, move the sheet of paper and so on. And the user should be in a way instructed not to think of the operator as a real person, but it's just some machinery that is moving the screen. So many, probably we don't need to do something so complex, but just to give you some ideas. Hmm? Uh, sliding on dynamic screens can be done, as we shown before, with many predefined screens or just some strips that uh, are used for switching from one screen to another. It can be horizontal switching, can be vertical switching. In this case, is a smartwatch, okay, where the scrolling is usually um, Top down and not left right, and uh, and so on. So, what do we do with these prototypes once you created them? Practically, how to use them? Uh, so, usually, you could have three people handling the test. In some cases, the three people can only be collapsed into two of them by merging the second and the third one, okay? So there should be one person which is the computer. We place the role of the computer with manages, who manages all the pieces of paper, okay? This person simulates the behavior, gives life, life to the prototype, basically, and uh, it doesn't do any action that the computer wouldn't do, okay? So if the user tapped in the wrong place, uh, nothing happened. Okay, it won't tell the user, no, you have to, to select the other one. It just acts as the computer. It never talks to the user, never gives suggestions, unless the computer would give that suggestion at that time. And the actions could be, in most of the cases, uh, just changing or handling the paper prototype, or it can also speak sometimes, uh, just to tell what message or what action would, would happen in this, in this moment, okay? So, for example, if there is an action which takes some time, it could say, okay, now it will be slow just to explain that uh, uh, what the computer is doing that, at that moment. Mm -hmm. So it can, in some cases, give with, with words some information that maybe you didn't prepare with the prototype. Mm -hmm. um, so this gives life to the paper. And the other two roles uh, that may be merged in a single person, if we don't have three people, for doing the experimentation. One is the uh, facilitator. So a person which, who is sitting with the user, helping them perform the, the, te the test, the tasks. Basically, we are creating a paper prototype to test the development of a task. Okay, sending an email, for example. And uh, so the facilitator should uh, explain the user what is the task that they are expected? Uh, and it gives them some idea, some broad idea about how the, the interface is organized. Okay, so we are here to test this interface. So the interface is has this big structure, macro structure, and we want you to try to execute this task, okay? And it's trying to keep the, the interaction with the user while the user is using the interface. So asking questions, what are you doing now? Please think aloud so that they can understand what you're thinking, what are your issues, what are your doubts or questions? What do you think this happens? Or what, what, is, what do you expect to happen when you are clicking this button and so on? Okay, so in a way it tries to um, extract information from the user while the user is trying to use the prototype. At the same time, if the user is totally off track, uh, it will stop him or her saying, okay, yeah. Mm, so there should be something wrong with the interface because you, you are not expected to take this track. 
please let's let's go back and do this step together. Or, always remember that if the user is doing something wrong, it's always the fault of the interface. Never never blame the user, right? We are there for testing the interface, not for testing the user. And you may have an, another observer that could be useful for uh, taking notes, basically. For observing, like the name says, and maybe taking notes of the important points. Why? Uh, because maybe the facilitator is already very busy no, with interacting with the user. So you may not have time to write down or take notes. You may forget some details, some important details about what the user is doing. Hmm? Uh, the facilitator is more focused on, on, the, on the thoughts of the user. The observer is more focused on the actions, where it does it put their finger, how much time does it take for the user to find the right uh, action, and so on. Hmm? So if we have the, the opportunity, we have this micro team of people that could uh, do these task experiments uh, with, with the users. Hmm? And so after experimenting with the user, what, the, what are the observer and the facilitator uh, trying to learn? Or trying to, to, yeah, to learn from the user? The, these are the main questions we can, we, can answer, we can get answers from with paper prototype. Do, do the users understand the interface? Step number one, okay? The evaluation gulf, you remember, from the first uh, uh, week. Um, does a user expect some functionality to be there? Are they seeking for some functionality and not finding it? So there, is there something missing? They want to delete a message, they don't find a way, they want to search and adjust to filter, and they are sick and say they don't, you, you didn't think about some functionality that for the user would be normal to have. Hmm? Uh, it doesn't need that, it doesn't mean that you really need to insert that. At least be aware that the user are expecting that. You may decide not to, uh, not to implement it. Of course, it's still your design. Okay? We are not following blindly, blindly the request of the user. We are designing but we must be aware, we want to be aware of the um, consequences of our design, design choices. Uh, navigation. So if, they, if we have more than one screen, can the user understand how these are progressing? Do they get lost? Do they come back frequently? Um, do they have all the information they need uh, on the screen where they need to enter it and so on? If you are writing some words or using some labels, some titles, are these clear to the user? So do they ask you for clarification about, I, I, I'm not sure whether this or that uh, menu would contain my, uh, the would contain information that I need to complete the task, okay? Would they click uh, on, the, on the wrong one? or maybe they don't find any label, any title, any menu item that would fit their need because maybe our labels are too generic. And uh, uh, yes, and what uh, visible, uh, visible uh, content you should put on the screen. So the user needs uh, some information. It doesn't find it on the screen because you forgot to put it. For you, it was obvious, but for the user, it is not. So these are kind of questions that we can answer with a paper prototype. Of course, we can't learn anything about the things that are not in the paper prototype. So all the color, all the layout, all the graphical, all the dynamic behavior, response time. Is it quick enough? Is it fast enough? We don't know because we have the manual computer which is which in paper. We don't have any real time uh, response. Um, there's a problem about the size of the changes. So if you, are, if you have an interface where maybe there's only a slight change, in a, maybe uh, one icon turns from green to red under some conditions. So everything else is static, but there's some detail that just changed. Uh, you cannot check whether the user is aware of the change, because for changing that in the, in the paper prototype, you would 
need to do a very macroscopic action, so changing something. So the user will notice it for sure, okay? But in the real interface, maybe it's a small change that would not be noticeable. So if you are relying on small details of small changes of interfaces, uh, their, their discoverability is not testable with paper prototypes. And uh, um, with a paper prototype, uh, the users know that the prototype is not infinite. It doesn't give you all the possibilities, all the functionality of the application. You are testing them on a single task or on a small number of tasks. So the exploration of a new interface, which is a dynamic that usually happens you know, when you go to a new, new app or a new website, you are first exploring. Let's, let's have a look uh, at the different section of different functionality without any, let's say, uh, explicit goal. The goal for you will be to understand more or less how it's organized. Okay, this dynamic cannot be tested with a paper prototype because the user, because it's not complete and the user knows it. So we'll never try to explore something that by design is not complete, doesn't give you the full picture. So it's a more deliberate interaction. The user already knows what he wants to accomplish because you gave them a task to execute, okay? So there are some exploration dynamics uh, that cannot be tested <clears throat> until we have a much more complete uh, prototype. So uh, this is the way in which uh, we are trying to use these prototypes, of course, as always, uh, first of all, we decide which are the tasks that we want to test, which are the questions that we want to, to know, for which we want to know the answers, and then we design the prototype and we uh, experiment them with users. Hmm? There are other types of prototypes I want, uh, for us, uh, they are less important, let's say we won't use them, but just for uh, having a, a complete overview, uh, there are also video prototypes, especially when you have an application, imagine a, a mobile application that you want to use, uh, maybe it's a map application when you want to, or a museum application, something like that. So it's not something that you can really test on a table because the behavior will depend on where you are going. And you cannot of even bring 27 pieces of paper on the go, uh, on, the, on the hallways of a museum, okay? It will not, simply not work. So in, that, in those cases, you could uh, create a video that may show the behavior or the interface under some conditions. Hmm? This is a simple one, which is just uh, shut up showing a concept of an application that will be is thought for creating a sort of a comic book of a situation, okay? So instead of posting a story uh, like we do today, uh, this girl is taking some pictures. You see she has a, just a, a paper, a cardboard prototype of a phone. Uh, you, she's faking, uh, taking some pictures and, okay, she goes, uh, inside and plays with the phone to organize the pictures into, into a story, okay? So we are just showing fragment, fragments of what is happening. She takes the phone and then it zooms to the behavior of the phone. So it's like a paper prototype, but you are, you are cutting the video just to not to show the, uh, the change of the paper. So she's faking, swiping through the pictures that she took. We don't need to see the pictures to understand what is happening, okay? She's composing the layout. She's, she's adding some speech bubble and so on. She's typing something. We don't know what, we don't care. We just know, okay, the, 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 the keyboard would appear, you change the font, and so on, okay? You can, you can get. Of course, uh, the technology is not, is not much more complex than uh, a paper prototype. Basically, it's a paper prototype, but uh, it, it will require you a lot of more time to film the video, mount it, uh, do, do some 
It's not as sophisticated as post-production. You don't need to do anything fancy. But even just cutting the different segments, putting them together, it will take you probably the better half of, of, of a day. Uh, but once you have this, you can easily show to other people. Just uh, You don't need to involve them in a, in a test. You can just show um, how, it's, uh, how it's supposed to behave. Okay, so of course we need to see all the all the possible functionality. Is there another possibility? Hmm? And it's time this is another to example button. where you see the video was made of uh, of uh, of a photograph. So it's not a real video; it's just a lot of of uh, still pictures that you are putting together to create a story. So it's another technique, probably. And where uh, this person is using an app that will track uh, your steps uh, so that you can maybe engage into a challenge, uh, let's walk together one million steps for you know, cha some charity or whatever. Okay? And so she's uh, faking going to the Everest mountain just by walking to the university, to the campus, uh, and they together have some, reach some goal compare some uh, performance with friends and so on. Again, the basic uh, uh, ingredient is a paper representation of the interface, uh, which is mounted together into a story. If you are showing this to users, uh, they will have less uh, opportunity, of course, to, they will have no opportunity to, uh, to interact with the prototype but they can see it in context. You can see it as a sort of a high fidelity or high quality um, storyboard. Instead of having some, just some comic panels, you have a, a short video that will tell you the, the, the same things. We not just tell you about the interface, but also about the user and the context. Is there a question? Uh, so the question was whether this video prototype may solve the, the, the problem of uh, uh, detecting small changes in the interface. Yeah, it may, it may do so, yes. Uh, you have, of course, to, again, to trick the user in showing the interface uh, and something flow, slightly changing. You don't, you should avoid just focusing, preparing the user for the change. So the user should not be prepared for that, it should happen. And then you can ask the user what, what did you see, or yes, did you see the change? Yes. You need to prepare a segment for that. Um, okay. So in this case, again, uh, we are not doing you know, high quality videos. We try to do something that will not, uh, you know, we, we don't want to invest more than one day in creating these kind of videos. Um, it's a tool for brainstorming. It's not a commercial presentation. It's not a pitch that you would do to the investor, see how, how, about, uh, how, no, it's something that you can show maybe to a group, to a panel group of users to get their feedback. Hmm? Um, you could, uh, uh, and of course you could go to medium or higher fidelity if you want to invest more. Hmm? Uh, usually the high fidelity ones are when you need money. So when, if you need money, you need to show something which is nice or more polished. Uh, with a good, maybe, background music and the voices to explain and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, before that, before this step, uh, only you know, a couple of hours, uh, maybe more, because it's a bit, uh, when you're being with videos and pictures, uh, it's always optimistic, uh, uh, saying a couple of hours, but to say one, no, no more than one day. Mm -hmm. um, there's also <laughs> a, a real, video prototype, a real world video prototype. So if you, if you don't want to, imagine you have a focus group of people, okay? You want to show them a video of how an application is used. You don't want to spend the time in creating a video. You just have one actor play the part in front of them in the same room, okay? You may act uh, uh, some portion of the interaction and maybe showing them on the screen the part of the interface that I'm touching in that moment. So it's, at, at that point, it will cost you just a paper prototype, nothing more, and you can 
explore the scenarios in, in, like, say in live, uh, in real time. Of course, uh, you start from a storyboard. You need to decide which is the story you are telling. And the story you are telling is most likely a task you want to accomplish. That girl wanted to document their visit, uh, their first visit to the New York campus. It was the first thing she went there, she took some pictures, and she wanted to share her experience with her friends. Okay? So that is the task, this is the, and the context in which the task is executed. And then you, we create a storyboard, we create a story, we create a video for showing those parts. And uh, um, it's better to focus on the most important tasks, so I wouldn't make a video for creating an account on the application, for example, which is... Uh, no. The first action you would do, but it's not the most interesting one. Um, and, uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, the topics of the video will be the one that your design team uh, is uh, discussing or has maybe some difficulty in deciding. So there are different visions in your group, uh, and uh, you cannot come to a synthesis, coming to a shared... Uh, uh, decision because there's no you know, clear way or clear better way than another. At that point, you can you could think of, of investing uh, two days, one for creating the video and one for uh, for say sharing it with a group of people. Uh, for and at that point, you will have more serious information about maybe which uh, alternative to take uh, or we, or we, which design design to pursue. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is always try to keep yourself from doing fancy things using the minimum technology. Just try to make your storyboard alive with the minimum effort. Hmm? Reduce, especially post-production and editing are really um, uh, time consuming. So try as much as possible to shoot live in real time. Uh, like, for example, I'm, I'm recording this, this lecture in real time. It doesn't cost me so much time. If I had to prepare a good video with the same lecture, it would cost me three times uh, more, uh, just because I need to stop and then to delete some places and correct some mistakes and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I try to, to make it as much as possible in live segments that just need to be sticks together, uh, you don't need, without any, any more expensive uh, um, editing and post-processing. The important part is the message. Given the context, given the functionality, given the user, given the, the task, uh, which are the most important you know, context, concept you want to show in the, in the video. Uh, Audio is a problem because uh, if you are recording live, you have, we will have any sort of uh, noises, okay? Even right now, there are some people uh, talking in the, in the hallway. It's okay. Uh, if we are here, we can filter that out. But if it's recorded in video, it will become uh, annoying, at least. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, you either put a, a very soft uh, or not invasive background music, uh, or maybe you can also make it silent. You see the first one had uh, some um, subtitles, some closed captions, just to show what happened, so you don't need to, uh, to, to care too much about uh, the audio, uh, the audio part uh, of the video, or the, of the recording. Hmm? This question is also interesting, the amount of interface you want to show in the video. So how much is the user behavior important or how much is the in interface important? So in the, our first video, it were more or less 50-50, okay? Um, we have some pretty clear details about the interface in the second part of the video. So the first one for understanding, was for understanding the context, the second one was for understanding the interface. You may decide that you are more interested on the first or more interested on the second, and so you will shoot different parts of the same video. Mm -hmm. uh, you could even not show the interface at all if you only want to understand how users will feel in the task that you are proposing. 
Um, and it would be nice uh, in the video also to see failures. So users that did something by mistake and they may correct it uh, also in the video. Don't make it too long, but uh, don't make it too perfect also. Hmm? Um, okay, so more or less uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, questions we can ask uh, from, say, from a user that is involved in the vision and the discussion of a video prototype uh, is that it's a very easy to communicate even complex scenarios, complex ideas. You don't need to explain anything. Just by seeing the story and for, by living the story, they can understand what is happening. So especially for contexts which are not familiar to the user or which are a bit new to them, it's a very effective way of showing them. You could also maybe show a very short video like this, uh, even without, without the interface, uh, before, doing, before testing the paper prototype. So you don't have to make a long explanation of how the system is working or what kind of... Uh, uh, goal uh, you can reach, uh, what is the purpose of the system. No, okay, H have a look at this video. Okay, now imagine you are one of these uh, guys and it's right uh, uh, for real on this paper prototype. It can be shared very easily um, on a video, but sharing is not so important because uh, if a lot of people are seeing your video, you, uh, it doesn't give you information about uh, what they liked and what they didn't like in the video itself. So it's good if you are trying to you know, promote it in some way, but for getting, uh, so design insight, you really need to, to look at it with the user with, uh, at the same time. Um, okay, and of course, uh, one of your potentially interested users are also the developers. Uh, giving an idea uh, about how the system is expected to be used uh, is also useful for people who are going to implement it. Uh, so they will have a um, clear and understanding of the context. Uh, these kind of prototypes are usually called uh, uh, low-level prototypes because actually they don't do anything. No, there are just sketches that we, we some, we pre we're playing some tricks uh, like filming them or like uh, operating them with an, an operator for making them alive or look alive. You can do also something more fancy, which are higher, uh, say, fidelity. Um, for example, by using, by storing or by managing this prototype with a computer. Okay? Uh, so it, they can be made interactive if you prepare the screens uh, on a computer, and when the user clicks on the screen, so then the, the, diff, uh, the, the content will change. We are not still talking about implementing the interface, but just drawing the interface and using a computer just to switch from the different parts of the, inter of the interface itself. Mm -hmm. So there are tools for creating this uh, medium fidelity, or in some cases, high fidelity uh, prototypes. Uh, we are switching to high fidelity when the interaction is real, is detailed, and also the look and feel is more detailed. The tools usually are the same. Uh, the medium fidelity prototype is sometimes called uh, just a mock-up or computer mock-up or a wireframe uh, because it looks like uh, you know, just have a, uh, an interface drawn with, with wires uh, to build the system, but the system is not there. You only have the wires. Uh, uh, putting them together. Uh, again, we are trying to use a way we drawing uh, to give the user the impression that this is still a work in progress, like we did with the paper prototype. And, and of course, in most of these uh, mockups are static. So we are just showing screens of the interface. Just these are three possible so interfaces for uh, three. Uh, frames for creating a mock-up of a web application, of a desktop application, of a mobile application. Uh, these are taken from one of these uh, uh, prototyping tools. When you have this kind of canvas, and then you can start putting, dragging, dropping uh, interface elements. So you are feeling that. Instead of drawing with the paper and pencil, you drag and drop elements, widgets, into these canvases. 
Uh, and then you have a, say, presentation mode where they can be shown to the user. Uh, for example, this is an interface of uh, a screenshot that I took from one of these tools. Uh, um, we have uh, some draft of a user interface. It looks like a browser, but it, you know it's not the real one. Uh, it look, they look like tabs, so you know that they're not the real. You, you see there is no um, say graphical design here. You understand that there will be different tabs. So the current one is this one, the products one. And this is the context, uh, some text, uh, some title, some picture, some search uh, engine, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so you may compose, usually you have a library that will contain most, most widgets, uh, so scroll but button, dialogues, uh, uh, accordions, uh, tabs, uh, all the elements that we have in the user interface. You can compose them and create that. The time for creating one page is slightly more than the time you take for hand drawing it. It's always slower because you need at least to align things in a, in a decent way. And some areas may be made uh, active. So for example, you are preparing four or five different uh, screens like this, corresponding to the different uh, tabs. And so with this tool, you can say, okay, when the user clicks here, switch to the other page. So there is a, even if we still have a, a static pages, we can fake a limited uh, interactivity, at least the navigation. There are some predefined, only some points in the page, so uh, usually you, you cannot write here, you cannot click on this button, for example, but you can click on the, click on the, on the tabs, navigation, if you want to test the navigation. So it's, so it's not a, the functionality is not complete. We don't need to add functionality to every element in the page. We only need functionality to some of these elements and the user can navigate through those parts only. So instead of clicking with the finger and having a friend switching the piece of paper, they are clicking with the mouse and the computer is giving them the next page. Of course, it's less flexible because when you have a human computer, it may cope also with the unexpected, unexpected situations. And here, if, we do, we, if you didn't think about a, a given situation, and now uh, it's, not, it's not ready, the tool cannot do it for you, cannot, cannot compensate for that. Uh, all these wireframing uh, wire or mockupping tools have usually a quite uh, large uh, library of components that give you the, the main hint about uh, what, you're want, what you want to put there. So for example, let's, you want to put a chart, uh, there's an, a sort of a widget, a graphical element uh, for the chart. You cannot personalize them usually. So you cannot have three bars instead of two. You cannot uh, mix maybe a bar and a line because the, the purpose is not uh, recreating the fidelity of the interface or the real data or the real content. The purpose here is showing here in the page, you will have a graph, a chart. Uh, or we will have a picture. So this is a picture of an avatar, for example. This is a picture of a map. And somewhere you should have a picture of a, a generic picture like this. Some picture. Hmm? Or a carousel of pictures. Like we show in the video, well, like we saw in the video, uh, she was wiping through some pictures, but with a, an empty box like that. But we all understood that there was a, a set of pictures um, changing. Today, we wouldn't use this kind of uh, uh, layout with a sort of a perspective uh, navigation, okay? It's not fashion anymore. Some years ago, uh, all the graphical application gave you this, this kind of uh, um, perspective view of different pictures. Right now, we are just uh, usually the um, fading or the uh, shifting from left to right of the image. So even the choice of elements uh, changes with the design style. And uh, this is an example of a, basically a file that you can download and print 
and then you cast it with the elements of the user interface for the early iPhones, for example. So you find a lot of, of these resources that will help you. Both, uh, if you print and cut them, uh, you can create, use them for creating paper prototype, and if you just you know, cut and paste the image, you can use them for creating a computer prototype with these elements. Uh, here we have some, I just reported some, some click, some links uh, to some of the tools that are being used, uh, online tools, websites, okay, that you can use for creating this kind of mock-ups. Hmm? Uh, more or less, they have the same functionalities. Uh, and all of them as a free trial period, and, uh, and, of, and, and all of them, of course, are, are paid products uh, if you want to use them professionally. Um, so they will let you create those. This is an example, uh, I just showing uh, of a workflow that I tried uh, for uh, sh one task. Okay, for example, this was a use case for I don't remember what application uh, where we tried uh, to to see all the possibilities of the user entering some some information. Okay, and you see, for example, that. You see here, this is not real text. It's just a placeholder with a wiggly line that looks like a title, okay? It's the same everywhere. Here, it looks like a, the icon of the website. So you see this, it's repeated in every page. This is the header that would be the same across. Uh, while the second title is explicitly written because we are using it to show the user the advancement of the, of the task. So the title is changing in the different steps, so it's conveying the user some information, and we wanted to include that information. It was important for this task, so we uh, modeled that, we, we drawn that. And, um, and we see that yeah, there are some pages that go forward, and some pages, uh, for example, this is an error page, this is an, another error page, and so on, that uh, we should also plan for uh, you know, wrong condition, anomalous conditions. Uh, and so it may happen that if you insert some data, the data is stored uh, correctly, otherwise it may give an error because the data is already duplicated or whatever. So always plan also for some experiment uh, where the data will be, or well, the, action, the user action will not be accepted mm -hmm. and see how the user reacts. This is all uh, fake data, so the user cannot select a, data, uh, a day from this calendar, cannot enter a description in this box uh, at all. It, it will just pretend it did and then click on next. Okay. In this interface, in this mockup, the, the um, elements where the user can click are shown in blue. Blue here, blue here, blue here, blue here, and so on. So the user doesn't waste time in looking, in searching through the page, you know, like you have um, you know, in the escape games, uh, when you have uh, an interface, you don't know which elements are really active, so you spend a lot of time in searching all the, all the, all the doors or the, uh, the drawers, so whether they can be opened or not. Uh, the user knows that only a, f a very few selected elements are active, so there's no point in letting the user discover those or search for those. Okay, this is another very, very old example that we found done with PowerPoint. So we don't need any fancy technology. Just a PowerPoint when you can decide the next page to go in the presentation when you click some button or some action. So wireframing are easy to use. You can very easily duplicate a page and modify it so you can create even complex scenarios. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, the wireframing tool only allows you to interact by clicking, uh, unfortunately. So you cannot, if you have some website which is really, uh, you know, relying on swiping, on scrolling, on other type of interaction, it doesn't just show so well on a, on a wireframe. Hmm? Um, if the behavior, the paths are static, so if the behavior depends on the data you enter, you're out of luck because you are not really entering data. So with a paper prototype, if a person is, is typing their name, then the operator may say, 
or your password, the operator may say the password is too short, and show them an error screen. With a mock-up, uh, this can be done, okay? You can decide when the user, whether when you, the user clicks on submit, uh, you will see the confirmation page or the error page. But this will not dynamically be adapted to what the user was pretending to enter. So in a way, again, there are different tools and each of these tools can help us discover different aspects. And we have, must uh, avoid you know, the user searching for the hotspot for a few elements that, that they can click uh, and try to help them find them easily. Uh, in the example I shown, they were automatically you know, pictured in the, or colored in, in, uh, in blue. Um, so what we, we test very well is the, the workflow. So the sequence of steps. And uh, so when the, there's a form where the user pretends to enter something, uh, we can ask uh, the user what, which information would they enter into these fields. And so see if, if they know, they understand which is information and if they have all the background that they need for understanding the question. And so they know what will happen in the next step and so on. Uh, it's not, of course, not good for testing the details of the user interface. So the tabs moving, the um, elements appearing or disappearing, uh, because the dynamics here is very, very limited. On a paper prototype, the paper, a paper prototype, prototype is more dynamic from this point of view. Hmm? And then, of course, we have the high fidelity prototypes uh, that look like the real thing. In some cases, they are calling them digital mockups. Uh, they may be a real application, maybe you are actually building an HTML page, maybe we don't, uh, without implementing any backend uh, functionality. So you only have the, all the, the front end, maybe with fake data, but you can actually uh, operate the, the, the menus, uh, change the pages, uh, and so on. Hmm? Um, you can create a real application with uh, many missing parts. There are also some tools, some prototyping tools that allow you, say, with, um, with an interface which is similar to the wireframing tools, uh, but uh, full with uh, layouts and colors and icons and so on. So in this case, you are creating a screenshot that looks like the real one. And you can also attach actions to the different elements of the interface. So you can really say, okay, when the user clicks here, what should be shown? So should something appear, should a new page be shown, and so on. So you are, uh, in a way, already programming something, whether in code or whether with some visual applications. Um, this was a, Pencil was a, was or his uh, an open source application. Nowadays, a lot of people are using uh, Figma, which is a tool for designers, and you can, use it for visual design, but also for interaction design in some cases. And you see that there's a, there's a, there are a lot of details, okay, in a page like this. You must select the fonts, you must select the uh, colors. Uh, uh, it may be, seem stupid, but here we have a, um, a box uh, with a semi-transparent background, and this semi-transparent background is also a gradient. Okay, it may take you one hour just to get the parameters right. To look it right, to make it look right. Hmm? So when you are adding the visual elements, uh, uh, each you know, a button or a title that just took you one second in a paper prototype or in a wireframe, now it takes you five minutes. Hmm? To align it properly, to, to choose the font size properly and so on. Okay, but of course, uh, when you show it to the, to the users, they will really uh, have more, uh, for example, they, the user could discover that this menu is not easy to read because there's too much, uh, too, the background here is too white. So there's not enough contrast here for reading this title. While here, the, the, the leaves and the, uh, the trees are very dark, so these white titles are easy to read. This is difficult to read. So this is a problem. Should we enclose the menu in, uh, in a background window like we did here to guarantee some minimum, um, say, contrast threshold? 
And this can only be discovered when you have the full graphics available, not before. Okay? But not, it needs to be done. The important part is that we, can, we will go to this level of detail only when everything else has been settled. Only we, we know how many items we have, what are their names, what are their actions, and so on. And so we can, we, we can in, add the design, visual design, into the mock-up as the last step. It will cost you more in creating it, but probably will also, many of these tools also have a possibility of exporting the design into HTML and CSS, so it may also be useful for starting the implementation, the real implementation. So it's already a, a step, uh, these high-level fidelity prototypes are a middle step between the end of prototyping and the starting of the implementation phases. Uh, and we don't use them for testing interaction or workflow. We don't want to create, uh, with this level of complexity, seven different screens just for testing the user inserting some information. We already, you know, studied the workflow at the wireframe level. Now we are testing the layout, the colors, uh, the clarity, the readability, the spacing, uh, and the notifications, and the status bar, and the lo a lot of little, uh, the many little information you are putting in the, the different parts of your application. Hmm? Um, so this is useful for you know, the, your final uh, test. Uh, I'm leaving here uh, a link here. Um, I don't tell you much about, uh, because uh, I, I don't want to spoil you the end of the video, okay? But the idea is uh, when you're looking at the first part the first part of the video is, is more interesting. Uh, when you're looking at this first part, uh, try to ask yourself, uh, is this a, re a real product or is it just a prototype? Mm -hmm. The second half of the video will explain. Mm -hmm. So just to see how people are, are playing this, with these uh, prototyping tools. Okay, so these are some tools for high fidelity prototypes. And I want to close with, uh, with the one last technique, uh, of uh, prototyping complex systems when uh, we want the user to, or we want to see how to respond, uh, how a user responds uh, to a technology that maybe doesn't exist yet or is too complex uh, to, to implement uh, today or for the prototyping purposes. So try to imagine you wanted to develop the first uh, um, smart speaker, okay? So a speaker where the user could, Alexa or Google Home or whatever are these devices today, okay? Okay, now we, if we want to ex experiment with the voice interaction, we can just take one of these devices and write our application, our skills and test it. But before that, how could they test uh, the concept of voice interaction without having the technology or the device available. Well, you can fake it. Uh, like with paper prototypes, you are faking the uh, human interaction. You can also test something that, uh, where you pretend you have a new interaction technology, pretend you have a new extra intelligent uh, devices, so maybe you have a chatbot that gives you very clever responses. But today you don't have the, the artificial intelligence technology for giving really the, those uh, responses. So how can you see how a user responds to a, uh, to a higher level of intelligence than the level you can accomplish today? Uh, one possibility is, okay, we work with the dumb prototype and try to understand in, indirectly. Or the other alternative is, uh, to, uh, let's say, fake the behavior by sort of uh, tricking the user into believing that you have this technology. These are uh, photographs for the movie, The Wisest of Oz. I don't know whether any of you have read the, this is a very, very old movie. And uh, the basic idea is that there was some people who were, were very um, afraid of this wizard 
because uh, this the house of the wizard uh, has a very strong voice, a very big uh, face uh, with a lot of uh, fire and thunders and whatever when, you, when he, he, want, he was angry. So a lot of people were giving, um, let's say, food uh, or an other type of gifts, uh, gifts uh, to, to the wizard so that he, could not, he would not become angry or would not kill all, all of them and so on, okay? Nice, so it's uh, a very powerful, very advanced uh, wizard uh, and uh, we should uh, admire him and so on. But then what they discovered uh, was that it, it was just a simple man behind a curtain that was moving some levers, some controls for uh, making sounds, for lighting fires, uh, for um, say showing the, the big face image and so on. So people believed in the real powers of the wizard, but actually it was just an ordinary man moving some, some controls. Okay? So uh, this is the idea. We don't have the voice technology. We use a person, maybe in the next room, that would respond like a very super smart speaker could ideally respond. So if I have in mind the capability of my artificial intelligence, what it could be done, uh, could be, it could, what it could respond in the future, and they may, may have a person that it will write the sentences estimating what a real intelligent uh, interface would respond. So the user doesn't know it. Until you go behind the curtain, you don't know whether the, it is real technology or it's uh, just a fake technology. Okay, there was this also story of the mechanical Turk was a, a, a machine playing chess and he was beating people. So you, won, you went there and uh, you saw that uh, there was a lot of just uh, mm, you know, mechanical devices, gears and, lever and pulleys and so on. And this was winning chess uh, games. So people really believed that this mechanism was able to to play a chess game. It turned out there was a, a, a dwarf person hiding, just hiding uh, behind the, the, the cloth of the, of, the, of the Turk, and the, the person was playing chess, okay? But was pretending, so there was a real man hidden that was pretending that the machine could do some action. So we can use this trick also in our uh, prototypes. If there is some part of the prototype that, for which it's important for us that the users believe that the technology is able to do something, but today we are not able to set a prototype that comes closer, <laughs> close enough to that functionality, we can use a person and disclose this person only at the end. Of course, we don't want the people to, to be really tricked, but we don't tell them at the beginning. We tell them, okay, this speaker is a new prototype, is implemented, it can give you some clever answers, so you can try to speak them, you know, in dialects or in, uh, in poems, uh, maybe, or whatever, and you can reply and understand you. So the person really thinks that you are testing a new algorithm, actually, you are testing the concept of the new algorithm and the reaction of the user to the hypothesis of this new algorithm. Okay. But you are, instead of investing maybe three years in implementing something very fancy that the user would find maybe useless, you are just uh, putting one person in the next room. Hmm? So it's a, it's a trick in, in a way, but it can help you test uh, some technology testing. Sorry, not testing the testing the reaction of the user to technologies that don't exist yet, basically. And so we, you can, it can give you the direction in which to invest for these technologies. Um, the last, uh, a few days ago, in this week, uh, there was, I think, the 20th uh, anniversary of the first iPod from Apple. And so if you search the internet, you see that there are very early prototypes of the iPod. Uh, with their, say, their, there was a revolutionary interface, I don't know if you remember it, if you see that uh, there was a circular menu. 
So instead of a button to go forward and back for changing the music, uh, there was just a ring when you just uh, moved your finger in circles in right, uh, in right and left uh, uh, fashion. Okay? It was the first time. It never happened before. But of course, before designing it and implementing all the sensor behind, you should first understand how the user would react to navigating by, say, rotation instead of by arrows up and down. So there are prototypes. They use physical prototypes. Fake, of course. They didn't play music and they didn't really have all the sensors. Uh, but uh, there was some operator that changed uh, the items, uh, and, but they, they saw the reactions of the user and how maybe the user can associate a gesture with an action. Hmm? Since it was a new technology, it was no pre prior knowledge. Hmm? And, uh, and so these are uh, techniques that can be used uh, in this kind of context. Uh, they can be used on, across a different levels of, of fidelity, of course. Depends on how you are packing your wizard. Uh, but can, by itself, is not a, a full prototype technique, but is a complement uh, uh, for inserting new technologies into existing prototypes. Um, of course, the, the important part, I, only, I will only comment the, the last point here, the last ballot here, is uh, this wizard should not be wild, should not be too intelligent, should not respond arbitrarily, but it should have a very strict uh, uh, rules of behavior because we are really uh, anticipating the behavior of the system that we have in mind, but we still don't, didn't implement or didn't uh, uh, research enough. And, uh, and so uh, it, should, it, should not, it should not be, the, let's say, the natural response of the person, but uh, the response that uh, the technology will give uh, in due future, in due time. Uh, so probably also the mechanical Turk will not uh, be, maybe will play chess below the, his real human level because he wants to maintain the impression of a given stereotype behavior by the machine. Okay, so it's an, a, 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 a possibility, let's say. Hmm? Okay, so basically the idea is that we have many prototyping techniques. We will spend our time in the lab more with the paper prototypes which are, because they are the richest one, those that with the least effort can let us get the most of the information from the users. But you know that maybe you can also have in the future, okay, other opportunity for creating different types of prototypes for getting different types of information from our users. Okay, uh, this, I will stop here because we are at the end. And the next time uh, we will switch the topic and we start to see some rules of design, guidelines uh, for, for actually putting together these interfaces. Okay? Thank you for today.